All right, good morning, almost good afternoon. I'm using a different mic setup. I would love it if anyone who's listening right now, if you could just say in the chat whether it sounds as good, if you can hear me at all, if you can't hear me, if the quality sucks, if it's good enough. Um, I've been using a headset mic and it's, uh, you know, when I'm only teaching for an hour, it's not too bad. But doing these two-hour classes back-to-back, -back, it's been giving me a massive headache, and I don't really want to have a headache after the end of every single workday. Okay, cool. So I'm hearing good things. I, I had been operating under the assumption that the microphone on this ancient borrowed laptop that I'm using uh, was a piece of trash, and I think I've been operating under a bad assumption. So I'm going to keep doing it this way as long as no one has any audio issues that are on my end. Uh, feel a little weirder now since I, I, I can hear myself talk. I had the, the type of headset, uh, which were, you know, not quite soundproof, but either way, these are issues y'all don't have to worry about. I'm just making sure that y'all can still hear me. So uh, we finished with 1.5 last class, which was on the, the very, very, very beginnings, the introductory simpler rules of doing a derivative. So we had the definition based on the limit where we said that the limit as h goes to zero of f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. We call that the derivative. We call that f prime. It gave us the instantaneous rate of change. We called it a derivative. And this was the definition based on the limit. Then we had, we introduced the power rule. We said that if your function was of a specific format, if it was a polynomial with just your general x to the n term, that the derivative f prime of x, you took the exponent, you brought it out front, you left the x there, and then you drop the exponent by minus one. We also had special cases where, like, if your function was a constant, the derivative was zero, or if your function was just linear, so a number times a variable to the first power, then the derivative was just the coefficient. And we related those geometrically as well as algebraically as to why they work. And we also showed with the power rule that it worked too. Now, we also said that if you had sums and differences that you could just take the derivatives of sums and differences on their own. I'm gonna start typing now because this is where we're getting into the, the, the new stuff. So the derivative of a sum or difference is just the derivative, is just the sum or difference of the derivative of each term. And the clacking on the keyboard might be a little louder now uh, from the mic, so hopefully that's not an issue. Uh, this is something, again, in chat, let me know, and you know we can <clears throat> adjust from there. I don't like having these, these notes pre-typed necessarily, but if I absolutely have to, I will. <clears throat> but I kind of like going at your speed. So the derivative of summer difference is just the summer difference of a derivative. In other words, having pluses and minuses of extra terms really doesn't have a drastic effect. But we did point out that this is not true for products or quotients. Let's see what someone said. How far will we know in advance? So we had said on the first day that tests will always be announced with a minimum of one week prior to the test. So, and I will always have, unless there's a special exception, when we finish a, the material for a test, the test will be one week later. So if I know, say three classes in advance, I know the next class I'm gonna finish the material for a test, then I'll say, hey, in three classes we're having a test. But the absolute worst case scenario is maybe I'm not sure if we'll finish a section or not, so I just hold off on saying that. And then when we do finish it, I'll say, all right, that's the end of the chapter. The next test is gonna be just on this chapter. 
So that means our test is in a week. So again, the main flow is we finish material and then a week later we have our test. Um, and the test is not just going to be on one day. You'll have a couple of days to get it done. I'm thinking two, maybe three days, depending on when we assign the test, whether it's over a weekend or during the regular week. So you'll have a couple of days to get this done because I know, you know, not everyone has the same situation. Some of us might be <laughs> sitting in our cars next to the TCC parking lot um, to get our internet. I don't know. So I just, I don't want to have just a designated hour, hour and a half for testing. You'll have some time. There will be reviews, and uh, as we get closer to the end of chapter one, which the first test will be on chapter one, then we'll start uh, spitting out some more details about it, whether the review will be emailed to you or whether it'll be in my math lab, whether the test will be a, uh, its, its own paper document or whether it'll be a my math lab test, because I'm gonna kind of mix and match things as we go. <clears throat> so good question, uh, but for now, let's get back into 1.6, product and quotient rules, product and quotient rules, it's the wrong button, <clears throat> 1.6, the product and quotient rules, I feel like I set up the title of this section perfectly. <clears throat> by saying, hey, our power rule, it's really nice and quick, it's got some special cases, and it even works really well with pluses and minuses of different terms. I've mentioned that it doesn't work for products or quotients, so there must be a rule that goes with those, and there most certainly is. So let's say that given, more underline, given a function expressed as a product, Let's say that product is f of x times g of x. That little star means times. I don't even have to have the star there. If I do this, that still means the same thing, but I want to be emphatic. You could just do a little dot. I would not want to use the x as a multiplier in a calculus class ever. That's just a bad idea. A business calculus class, at least I should say. If we're going into multivariable calculus and doing cross products, that's another story. So if your function, I'm not saying the function is f of x. I'm not saying the function is g of x. I'm saying the function, I'm gonna think about it as a product of one thing and another thing. So I'm thinking about the function as a product of two functions, kind of. So given the, the function expressed this way, its derivative would be, So I'm going to write this out in hand. So d dx, the derivative of something written as a product. So again, the thing inside the bracket here was our original function, and I'm saying to take the derivative of it. So we're using that Leibniz notation. I don't want to use f prime because I'm saying f is one of the insides to this. Same thing for g. I could call this function h of x, but then it's just too many letters. So the way this works, and it's another case of we're not going to do the derivation. This is not a derivation class in general. We'll do that sometimes, but very rarely. It's f prime times g of x plus f times g prime of x. In other words, if you wanted to use your words, the derivative of a product is the derivative of the first times, so let me say the derivative of the first function times the second function plus the first function times the derivative the second function. That's using our words. Each of these terms has something about the first and the second function, fg, fg. In the first term, it's the first part of the product that has a derivative, but the second one does not. In the second term of this, 
the first part of the product now is not have does not have a derivative, but the second one does. So it's a mix and match. Think of this as a mix and match. Each of these terms has to have something from both parts of the product, where one of them's the derivative and the other's not. Now, honestly, there are a ton of ways that you can rearrange this formula. And this is a formula that you have to memorize. This is known as the product rule. We will use it over and over and over and over and over. So you had better memorize this yesterday, and I'm saying that exaggeratively, but as soon as possible. So this is a little bit more than just the power rule, and most of the time these f's and g's are going to be polynomials, so when you actually go to do this f prime of x and g prime of x, you'll be doing the power rule to get those. Now, something I've mentioned in before, I've mentioned before, and I will still mention every now and then, we are going to be doing derivatives of a very limited set of class of functions. We stick to polynomials and rationals and radicals almost exclusively. We don't do anything with trigonometry, so sines, cosines, and tangents. In a regular calculus class, we'd be doing derivatives of those. We'd have formulas for those. The analytics of them are much more complicated and complex, and those are two different words and meanings. <laughs> Um, we'll get into exponentials and logarithms eventually in here, but we only do a couple of the types of those, whereas in a regular class we do all of the types, so which that means more formulas. Again, the point of this conversation being we really don't have to memorize but maybe 25% of the formulas of a true calculus class. So I don't really like to ever hear people complaining, oh, I've got to memorize all these formulas. And I know that, you know, hey, you're not in a real calculus class, so your complaint might feel validated. But again, imagine if this was the real calculus and we had four times as many formulas, all of which are more complicated than what we get. So just take that as a grain of salt is all I'm saying. So what's the variability of this? How can you play around with this? You, can, you don't have to have the first term have the F prime. The second term could have the G prime and the first one could have the F prime. You don't have to use the function notation. So here's a shorthand version of this. D dx without showing the variable dependency f times g. This would be f prime g plus f g prime. Or you could have this. I was just, I'm just going to use a different color uh, to say it's the same thing. The prime orders don't matter. I could do f g prime plus f prime g. Or the order of the f's and the g's don't matter. I could do g then f prime plus g prime then f. Or I could go, I can do g first in one and f first in the other. I could do f times g prime plus g times f prime equals, the list goes on and on and on because of the different properties of addition, the commutative property, the associative property. You can swap the order of products and it doesn't matter. You can swap the orders of sums and it doesn't matter. So I'm not gonna write this rule 50 times every time and you can do it any of these one, two, three, four, five different ways I have plus any of the others that actually work as well. So there's like 16 different ways you can get this right ultimately. But as long as you have a way that works with you consistently, Instead of saying f and g, what I tend to say is first and second. So instead of saying f, I'll say first. So that's the derivative of the first times the second plus the regular first times the derivative of the second. So this is kind of how I'll talk things out typically. I'll say first and second instead of f and g. So these little one exponents, we should know by now these are meant to be primes. That really is one of the major reasons that we say don't ever write exponents of one. Because when you get to calculus, an exponent that's one kind of looks like a prime, which looks like a derivative. So let's try this out. Let's stop rambling. Let's not talk about it. Let's be about it. Example one, and we're going to find the derivative using the product rule. A. 
And we're going to start out with something simple. f of x equals x cubed times x squared. Now this f is not the same f and g from before. I'm saying the function is f of x. Before I was using f and g to denote a first and a second part of a product. So the x cubed is kind of like the f of x in the, the rule itself. But again, I'm not going to call it f and g. I much prefer just to call these things first and second. So I'd call the x cubed the first and the x squared the second. That's a product. So the f prime of x would be, we're going to take the derivative of the first times the second. And I will admit, this is not my preferred order, but it's how I start things out because that's the way the textbook does it. But I do have a better order, in my opinion, that I'll emphasize sooner than later. So we're going to go the derivative of the first times the second plus, and then flip-flop, first times the derivative of the second. Now, each of these is a power rule. So maybe we want to go ahead and lay things out as to what they are. If you want to show what the derivative of the first is and what the derivative of the second is, that's not the worst idea in the world. So if the first thing is x cubed, it's derivative. These are all just power rules. Bring the power down, drop its exponent by one. So that would be three times x to the second power you should all have that power rule memorized absolutely already. If you don't, it is going to do nothing but hurt you. If you spent five days over the weekend without putting any hours into math, that terrifies me. The second function is x squared. So we're going to take its exponent and put it down in front, so the two. We leave the x alone. But then we decrease its exponent by one. Two minus one is one. I'll write the one, but I'm going to write it using the fancy one, so you can really see that it's not a prime. But again, I'm not going to write that x to the first anymore from now on. So going based above, the derivative of the first times the second. So you're just doing a mix and match. One time you use a regular, then the, the derivative. So the derivative of the first is this. That's the 3x squared. That's the derivative of the first. And I'll do the derivatives in red and the non-derivatives in black. So then times the second function times the g of what I'd call g of x. The second was the x squared. See, one of them's a derivative, the other is not. That's what's important. Then we have a plus. That's our plus symbol separating them. And then we just do a first and a second again. But because we used the derivative of the first last time, we'll do the derivative of the second this time. So we're going to use the regular old first function was the x cubed times. Then we'll do the derivative of the second function, which the derivative of the second was the 2x. So again, the reds were derivatives, the blacks were not. But this is able to be cleaned up, so we should absolutely clean this up. I'm just going to stick to black now. So 3x squared times x squared, that's 3x to the fourth, and plus. x cubed times 2x, well, x cubed times x is x to the fourth, so that's 2x to the fourth. And what we end up here with is something that has like terms, x to the fourth, x to the fourth, so we add the numbers in front. 3 plus 2 is 5. So we get 5x to the fourth. So our final answer, f prime of x, is 5 times x to the fourth. Now, maybe you don't trust this. Do you trust this? I didn't prove the formula. I just said, here it is. Here's the product rule. Jump off the cliff with me with a leap of faith, metaphorically speaking, not literally. Trust me. Well, one of the best things you can do when you're given a formula, if you don't trust, is try and rearrange the original function into something you would have known how to use before the formula. Do the derivative that way and see if you get the same answer. So what I'm going to do now is an alternate approach. So that f of x, which was x cubed times x squared, I hope that every single one of you knows that that could have just been written as x to the fifth. So our function is really just x to the fifth. 
which means we can take the derivative super simply just by using the power rule. It's a single term, so there's no product anymore. We can just do the power rule. Drop the five out front, leave the x, but decrease its exponent by one. Five minus one is four, and it's the same answer. So yes, that product rule did work. So what you might be thinking is, all right, Mr. Beckner, if it's so much quicker to do it by multiplying ahead of time and then the derivative, why would you take the derivative and then clean up afterwards? Why would you have ever done it the way the black and red ink lays out instead of just do it the blue every time? Because guess what? Your original functions that you have to take a derivative of are not always that simple. It's not always just x cubed times x squared. Usually, it's something like x plus 3 times x minus 7 or uh, 5x to the third plus 7x squared minus 12x plus 3 times and then something equally as long. And doing that product before the derivative might be more time consuming then. Or maybe you don't even know how to do that product, but if you have the product rule, you can at least take the derivative and get something analytically correct. So that is the reason we have the product rule because usually our functions are not this simple. Me, personally, your teacher, if I had this function as a homework problem, x cubed times x squared, and I wasn't told to use the product rule, I would have said, I would have done it the blue way. So let's see another one. Let's step up the difficulty just a touch. B. Let's have our function, whether it says f of x equals or y equals or whatever, and you don't even have to write it as a function. I can just write the, the polynomial terms. Let's have 2x plus 3 in parentheses times x cubed minus 2. That's x cubed minus 2. So yes, admittedly, if you wanted to do the derivative of this, you could FOIL it out first. So take the 2x times the x cubed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Then you could just do a derivative and it would all be regular old power rules. But maybe you're just, you don't want to FOIL, you want to go ahead and do your derivative and then deal with the rest of the math later. Or maybe it's a much worse product and you'd rather go ahead and do the derivative now. So let's again identify what the first and the second things are. The first is this parentheses, the 2x plus 3. That's what I call first, and then I'll call the x cubed minus 2 the second. If you want to call them like a y and a z, or an a and a b, or you know, give them some letters, that's fine. But I like using first and second. So the derivative of the first, we're just considering the first parentheses now, 2x plus 3. So the derivative of the first. All right, the derivative of 2x, this was one of those special cases. I'll scroll up to a minus 1 last time. The derivative of a linear term, just a number times a variable, is the coefficient because the derivative of, of a line is its slope, and the slope is the coefficient. So the derivative of 2x is just 2. Then the plus 3, the derivative of a constant, scrolling up again, the derivative of a constant is 0. And again, we've rationalized this all algebraically and geometrically last time. The derivative of a constant is zero. So if you feel the need to write a plus zero here, you can, but I'm not going to do that anymore. The derivative of the 2x was the 2. The derivative of the 3 is nothing, and I'm not going to write nothing. That's a lot of negatives. Not nothing. All right, well, how about the derivative of the second function? That's our x cubed minus 2. So for the x cubed, we bring the 3 out front. We write our x, and then we decrease the exponent by 1. So the derivative of x cubed is 3x squared. Then there's a minus and a 2. But the derivative of a constant, the derivative of 2, is nothing. So I don't need to write a plus 0 here. All of that would be unnecessary. I'm just going to do this. So the derivative of the first is just 2. The derivative of the second is the 3x squared. So with that, we are able to get our f prime of x, the derivative of the original function. <clears throat> so again, it goes in the particular order I'm using for now. And again, not the order I like ultimately. I'll change this order a little bit later, but it really doesn't matter because there's like eight, maybe 16 different ways you can write it, and all of them are right. So I'm going to go the derivative of the first times the second. And the derivative I'll do in red ink. 
So the derivative of the first was this two times. Then the second function was the x cubed minus two. Why is that circle still there? There we go. Whack. So the second function was the x cubed <coughs> minus two. Again, this is the derivative of the first <coughs> times the second. Then we go plus. Now, since we used the derivative of the first last time, let's use the regular first this time, which was the 2x plus 3. And you definitely need lots of parentheses for this stuff, especially for binomials and trinomials. Then times. Now, last time we used the regular section second function, so we're going to use the derivative of the second function, which is the 3x squared. <clears throat> Again, derivative of the first, second, plus first, derivative of the second. It's a mix and match. None of these terms has both derivatives. None of these terms has both regular functions. Each term has an f and a g, or a first and a second, so to say. And now we just need to clean this up. With the first part, we got a 2 that we can distribute. So f prime of x is equal to 2x cubed minus 4. Then for the second part, we have a 3x squared that we can distribute. We can give the 3x squared to the 2x and then to 3. So 3x squared times the 2x is a plus 6x cubed. Watch your signs for everything, of course. Then a plus. 3 times 3x squared is a 9x squared. And then if you have any like terms, you combine them. 2x cubed, 6x cubed, that makes an 8x cubed. Then we have a 9x squared, so plus 9x squared, then the minus 4. So f prime of x is equal to 8x cubed plus 9x squared minus 4. That's the derivative of the original function. <clears throat> I'll do the trust fall, if you want to call it that, one more time and only one more time. So do you trust this? Because it gets much worse to, to do this trusting issue after this part. So we're going to get to more complicated ones. So let's take the original function and let's foil it out. Before we do any of this derivative stuff, let's foil out the original function. So the 2x times the x cubed would give us 2x to the fourth. Again, that was the 2x times the x cubed. Then the 2x times the negative 2 is a negative 4x. So we've distributed the 2x. We're done with that guy. Now let's distribute the 3. The 3 times the x cubed, that's the inner. <clears throat> we did the first and the outer. Uh, so that's going to be, and I don't want to leave that blue cross out. So 3 times x cubed is a plus 3x cubed. Then 3 times negative 2 is a negative 6. So if you take the derivative of this, which is just a straight up power rule, there's no products anymore. The derivative of the 2x, 2x to the fourth, remember constant coefficients just stay out front, so you leave your 2 out front, so 2 times. Bring the 4 down, then decrease its exponent by 1. So again, the 2 stayed, the 4 got brought down, and then its exponent dropped to a 3. Then we have a minus 4x. There's no exponent with this term, so that's one of the special cases. The derivative is just the coefficient. It's not 0. It's negative 4. Then we have this 3x cubed. So plus, leave the original 3 out front. So the 3 I've written here is this one. Then bring the exponent down, which is also a 3, coincidentally. Decrease the exponent by 1, sets so x to the second. Then we have this minus 6 at the end, but the derivative of a constant is 0. So the derivative of the minus 6 is a plus 0 that I'm not going to write. I'm going to erase it. Well, guess what happens when you clean this up? You get f prime of x is equal to 2 times 4 is 8. So that's 8x cubed. The minus 4 stays. Then a plus 9x squared. And you know what? There's nothing <coughs> necessarily wrong with the order of these, but we generally like things in descending order when we can make that happen which is 8x cubed plus 9x squared minus 4, which is the same thing we got originally. 
So I hope that that's enough for you to trust this product rule by now. If you don't, you can continue to show the work both ways, but I can guarantee that this is going to get much, much uglier. All right, so let's try another one. We got a couple more up our sleeve. And I'm actually gonna swap the order of C and D that I usually do, not that you care. And I'm gonna write this as Y instead. Y equals parentheses, X to the fourth plus X squared plus one times X cubed minus X. So yeah, you could take this trinomial and multiply it by a binomial. You'll have six products to do. That's kind of a nuisance. Maybe it would be easier to do the product rule and then deal with what you have after the fact. Maybe I'm lying, maybe I'm not. There's variability here. Sometimes it is actually easier to do it one way versus the other. And guess what? I guess how you figure out which one's quicker, practice. So you learn, hey, I should do this type. Uh, I should go ahead and multiply this type quicker. I'm sorry, I should multiply this type first because it's quicker. And then you'll say, all right, this type that I've done 100 times, I know that I should do the product rule first, then multiply everything out because it's quicker. But if you only do this three or four or five times, you're not going to learn those efficiencies, which is why I say, even though we only have typically 10 to 20 homework problems, do problems over and over and over. Go to your online textbook. Go to the homework section because there's way more homework problems listed there. Go to the internet. Find things that are similar so that you have more practice. I wish that the homework wasn't departmental and that I could just give you like 100 problems and say, hey, do this. But then I'd look way more mean than the rest of the teachers. But unfortunately, my students would be more proficient. So it's a give and take. All right. So I'm just going to go straight to the product rule. So I'm going to call the first, and I got to scroll down. The first is this parentheses, the x to the fourth plus the x squared plus one. And then the second would be the x cubed minus x. So let's do the derivatives of those things individually. So the derivative of the first. <clears throat> the four is brought down. Then you decrease its exponent by one. So that's four x cubed. That's the derivative of the x to the fourth. For the x squared, you bring the two down, so plus two leave the x alone, decrease its exponent by one. So I'll write the one fancy so you can tell it's a one. And then plus, the derivative of a constant is zero. So there's a plus zero here you can imagine, but I'm not gonna write it. So that's just the derivative of the first, meaning that the derivative of the second, <clears throat> so we're looking at the x cubed minus x now, we bring the three out front, then we have our x, and we decrease its exponent by 1. So 3 goes to 2. And there's a minus symbol. <clears throat> and the derivative of x, this is a linear term, which means the derivative is its coefficient. Now, you don't see a number written, and we don't see a coefficient. You know that it's supposed to be a 1. So the derivative of x is 1, but that's a minus, which makes it a minus 1. If you apply the power rule, it still works. If you start with x to the zero, then the derivative, I'm sorry, if you start with x to the first, pardon me, the f prime, you'd have a one out front, then an x to the zero. So that's one times one, which is one. So that was just some side confirmation that we've done before. All right, now we didn't use f, we used y. So when I write, when I write the derivative, I need to write y prime, or I can write dy over dx. I could have been doing df dx before as well. Remember, I like to use both notations uh, interchangeably because they mean the same thing. So again, when you're doing this, the main issue is to make sure in each term, you've got, part, you've got something from the first and something from the second, where in each one, one of them should be a derivative and the other should not be. So if you do the derivative of the first in the first term, then the derivative of the second should be in the second term or vice versa. There's a lot of freedom with the order you write things. I just like to be consistent for now. So I'll go 
once again, the derivative of the first times the second plus the first times the derivative of the second. So I'll do the derivative of the first and the first and the derivative of the second and the second. So the derivative of the first, that's red, 4x cubed, red, plus 2x, I'm not going to write the first power. Then this is supposed to be times, but that's a binomial, so you better wrap it in parentheses. So since this was the derivative of the first, now I'm going to use the regular second. Now the second function is the x cubed minus x, so x cubed minus x. But again, multiple terms, so you better wrap it in parentheses then a plus symbol. So in this one, it went derivative of the first, so we better use the regular first this time. The regular first being this trinomial, x to the fourth plus x squared plus one, and we're gonna multiply it by something else, and to make sure all three terms get multiplied, parentheses. Now we use the regular first, so for the second, it better be the derivative. So that was this, the three x squared minus one. Multiple terms, Wrap it in a parentheses, theme of the day. Now, unless this is just super chaotic and crazy looking, you generally need to simplify this as much as possible. Sometimes you can factor. It could be a GCF, it could be other stuff. That says GCF comma, et cetera. That got a little slot because I ran, it, ran out of room. Your GCF can be a binomial or a trinomial. That is always a possibility, so look out for that. If this parenthesis, if one of these parentheses was an X minus seven and then this, this thing had a parenthesis X minus seven, you could take it from both of them to make this much simpler. I don't really see anything like that happening right now. You can take some X's from each of these parentheses, but not these, so. Let's just stick with this. Y prime equals, let's foil the first red and black. So 4x cubed times x cubed would be 4x to the sixth. Remember, you're adding exponents. Then 4x cubed times negative x would be a minus 4x to the fourth. Then the inner, 2x times x cubed would be a plus 2x to the fourth. Then the last, 2x times negative x would be a negative 2x squared. You have got to be on top of those simple algebra rules. If you don't have those, you can't do calculus. Calculus is easy. Calculus is just memorizing the formulas. The rest of it is entirely algebra. No one fails calculus because of the calculus. They fail it because of the algebra, because they don't learn the pre-calculus stuff, because they wait four years to take this class, because they, won't wanna, they don't wanna practice. So again, that was just foiling the first parentheses. Let me pick a different color to show the distributing of the second. So I, I can only call this distributing the x to the fourth, the x squared and the one, to the three x squared and the negative one. It's six products. If you got three terms and two terms, it's six products. If you had three terms and four terms, it'd be 12 products. It's a number of terms times the number of terms. All right, so distributing the x to the fourth, I'll focus on this one first. That's a plus, x to the fourth times three x squared, that's gonna be three x to the sixth. Then x to the fourth times negative one is a minus x to the fourth. Now I'll focus on, oops, that was weird. The x squared, and I just learned a trick. If I hold this button down and hover over stuff, it erases, for better or worse. I don't know why, it, worked before and now it's not. Okay, <laughs> I'm still figuring out my pen if you can't tell. All right, so now let's distribute the x squared. x squared times three x squared, that's gonna be a plus three x to the fourth. x squared times the negative one is a negative x squared. Now let's distribute the one. One times anything is the anything, so that's plus three x squared minus one. And at this point, we can combine like terms, CLT, combine like terms. So we get y prime equals 4x to the sixth plus 3x to the sixth is 7x to the sixth. I'm going to squiggle the ones I've used. I don't want to cross them out. So 4x to the sixth, where is it? Plus 3x to the sixth gave us that. 
Then our x to the fourth. I don't have any x to the fifth. So the x to the fourth. So we got a minus 4x to the fourth plus 2x to the fourth minus x to the fourth plus 3x to the fourth. We've got four of them. And we're just going to combine the coefficients. So that's a negative 4. Uh, sorry, my eyes went cross for a second. That's a negative 4 plus a 2, which is negative 2. So we're done with these two. We've got a negative 2. Then we got another one here that's a minus, that's negative three. Then we got another one here that's a positive three and negative three plus three is zero. So in fact, all of the x to the fourth terms cancel. Negative four plus two minus one plus three is zero, if you check that out. So there's no x to the fourth term. For the x squareds, there's no x cubed. So we got a negative two x squared minus one x squared, so that's negative three plus three, negative three plus three is zero. So there are also no x squared terms. And we're done with everything except the minus one. So here's the minus one, bring it down. There's nothing to combine. So that's our derivative. dy dx or y prime, however you want to write it, is seven x to the six minus one. Now I'm not saying whether this problem is easier or not. If you do the product rule, then simplify, or if you simplify, then do the product rule. Sometimes it's easier to simplify first. Sometimes it's easier to do the product rule first. It depends on the problem. This one, honestly, it, it's, it goes either way. Me, having done hundreds of these, I would argue it's better to do the multiplying first, but that's not always easy to do. And we'll see that in the next problem. So you could, on your own, go back and do that blue, do you trust it stuff, and Go ahead and multiply this sixth products initially, then do the power rule. I think that's easier, but it's about the last time that I would say that. So for D, which is my C, F of X equals parentheses, X cubed plus square root of X, uh-oh, uh-oh, those are always fun, times three X squared minus five X plus two. Okay, so if you're going with this whole first and second thing and how you write things out doesn't matter to me, but I'd call the x cubed plus the square root of x the first, and then I'd call the 3x squared minus the 5x, what am I doing? I'm, I'm talking and writing at the same time. The 3x squared minus 5x plus 2, I'd call that the second. So when you go and take the derivative of those things, if you think about them as their own quantities, the derivative of the first well, this one's going to be a little bit more work because of the square root of x. So when we take the derivative of x cubed, that's going to be 3x squared. The exponent goes out front, and then it decreases by 1. Plus, now the derivative of the square root of x, we did this last class, it turned out to be 1 over the square root of x. I'm sorry, 1 half. 1 half. There's a 2 in the bottom. Let me, I want to clean that up a little. 1 over 2 squared of x. If you need to see that one more time, I'll do that over here. Uh, if f of x, if y equals the square root of x, which is x to the 1 half, then y prime will be 1 half times x to the negative 1 half, because you're doing 1 half minus 1 which is 1 half minus 2 over 2, which is negative 1 half. But you don't like negative exponents, so you bring it to the bottom. That's 1 over 2 x to the positive 1 half, which is 1 over 2 square root of x. So that's where this came from. The last part of the first derivative came from all this blue stuff over here. Again, the negative half, that came from this, just doing fraction subtraction. All right, so back to the second. Let's do the derivative of the second, which will be significantly easier. So the derivative of 3x squared, we're going to leave the 3 out front, 
drop the two down, and then decrease the exponent by one. That's gonna give us six X. So I'll, I'll write something that I'm gonna erase. I don't wanna take up the whole area for this, but we had the three, then the times. We bring the two out front, we have our X, and then the exponent drops to a one. But the three times the two is six. So that three times two times X becomes six X. Then we have the minus five X term. That's linear, that's a special case. So the derivative is just the coefficient, it's just the minus five. Minus five. Then for the two, that's a constant, that's the other special case, the derivative of a constant is nothing. That's a horizontal line, horizontal lines have a slope of zero. So that's the second derivative. So in terms of thinking about the functions as a first and a second, as a, in, a, in terms of a product, here's the derivative of the first part, here's the derivative of the second part. So now what we can do is say, so f prime of x, the derivative, df dx, if you want to, df dx, just giving you both notations again. Formula, the variation I like for now, derivative of the first times the second plus the first times the derivative of the second. So the derivative of the first is the 3x squared plus the 1 over 2 squared of x. 3x squared plus 1 over 2 squared of x. Multiple terms, so wrap it in parentheses, times. So that was the derivative of the first times, now we're going to use the regular second function, not the 6x minus 5, pay attention. It's the trinomial, the 3x squared minus the 5x plus 2. Multiple terms, so wrap it. And a plus symbol. Derivative of the first times second. Now flip flop it. The first, the first function being the x cubed plus square root of x. Multiple terms, so wrap it. Then times the derivative of the second, which is the only thing we haven't used, the 6x minus 5. Notice we use all of the bits. First, second, derivative, first, derivative, second, all four of those things get used. You just have to have them in an appropriate order. And again, there's like eight or 16 different appropriate orders that would work. This is just the particular way I do it. And the only reason I do it this way is because it's the way the textbook likes to do it. Actually, that's a lie. That's, I'm doing it the way the old textbook likes it. This textbook does it uh, derivative of the second, then derivative of the first. Doesn't matter, it really doesn't matter. Now, you can arguably clean this up. And if this was a regular calculus class, that's something that I would emphasize. For now, let's just say this is the answer. So while you can clean this up, let's leave it for now, which is also what your homeworks do. Um, your homeworks are allowing you to leave square roots and bottoms. They are allowing you to leave products like this for more complicated answers. So for now, we're just gonna leave this alone and say that's the answer. Because this would be, a significantly more challenging problem if we actually go through and distribute these six products, foil these, clean up, rationalize the denominators to then combine terms that we can combine with. You're multiplying an x squared with square roots, so you have to go back to the rational exponent forms. <clears throat> it's just a bit of a mess for now. So like I said, we're going to leave it alone. You also it may be acceptable to write this version, and I'll do it in blue. I have seen problems uh, where it's okay to write 3x squared plus 1 half x to the negative 1 half times 3x squared minus 5x plus 2 then plus x cubed 
plus x to the one half times six x minus five. I have seen our homework. I've been diving much deeper into it um, to make sure I can relate things to y'all. I've seen problems where they're letting answers have rational exponents. So what I'm saying is my math lab should take either of these versions, even though I definitely have a preference. Uh, I definitely prefer the top version versus the blue version. But it is what it is. So just make sure that you're able to get the answers right in your homework, because if I do a test that's my math lab based, which I will be doing, I just don't know if I'm going to do all of them that way, then you have to understand what my math lab prefers. You practice in the homework to then know what the test wants. Okay. So that's our product rule. We spent a solid amount of time on that. That's half the name of the section. The other half of the name of the section was the quotient rule. So we should probably talk about the quotient rule. Product rule is for products. The quotient rule is for quotients. So given a function expressed as a quotient, in other words, a fraction, a fraction, <laughs> a fraction. And let's say that it's originally written as f of x over g of x. And again, you can also just say first over second. That is definitely what I prefer to say. <laughs> the derivative of this quotient, the derivative of this fraction so this is us to say, saying take the derivative of the f of x divided by the g of x, or the first divided by the second, or just f over g. You don't have to have the function dependency, as we've said. Now, I'm going to go ahead and say out of the gate, warning, 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 warning. While there was a lot of different ways you could write the product rule, you could interchange the first terms with the second terms. The main issue was just making sure you had a derivative in the right place uh, and a non-derivative in the right place you don't get as much pliability here with the quotient rule. And that's because there's a minus between them instead. So it's going to be a blah, 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 minus blah, 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 which says these two things are not interchangeable, so you have to get used to this. So the way I like to write this is g of x times f prime of x minus g prime of x times f of x all over g of x squared. Once again, you have got to memorize this rule. So some alternate ways, if I just say the ddx of f over g, I could write g f prime minus g prime f over g squared, or I could write, Uh, what's my favorite? G times F prime, the second times the derivative of the first, minus the first times the derivative of the second over G squared. So I'm going to put a little circle around my favorite version. It looks really close to the black one, the black version, but I swapped the order of the G and the F. What in the heck did I write there? Something's wrong. Please forgive me there. I had this squared in my head a little too soon. G F prime minus F G prime. So that's my favorite way, which in terms of first and second, so if you say the derivative of the first over the second, that would be the second times the derivative of the first minus the first times the derivative of the second, all over the second squared.
some people might say it doesn't make sense to call them first and second when it's top and bottom. It makes more sense to do it that way with a product. You know what? I kind of get your argument, but it works either way. Instead of using first and second, guess what you could say instead? Top and bottom. So you could say, let me scroll down a little, DDX of top over bottom, just going to abbreviate with T and B. It's going to be the bottom times the derivative of the top minus the top times the derivative of the bottom all over the bottom squared. I don't care how you're memorizing these rules. I care that you're able to have a version that you're used to and that you can get answers correct with it. So again, the typical way I'm gonna be saying things is like this. The only things you can really swap are in this first term in the top, you can swap the order of the derivative of the first and the second. And that derivative looks a little thick. Just make that prettier. So you can swap the second and the derivative of the first, you can swap the first and the derivative of the second, but you can't swap anything from before the minus with anything after the minus. That's the major difference between the product rule. There's a lot of room, there's a lot of wiggle room in the product rule. There's very little wiggle room in the quotient rule. And the bottom is always the bottom squared. And once again, you're taking this as a leap of faith without me deriving anything, go to the internet, go to your textbook if you wanna see de uh, derivations. But again, this is not a theoretical calculus class. This is an applied calculus class. So we are where we are. Example. What do we have to example two? Yes, we are. Guess what we're gonna do, find the derivative. using the quotient rule. And we will start out with an example that we can verify it works. X to the eighth, it's an ugly eight, over X to the second. So we're gonna do this with our new rule and then we'll do it again in a much simpler version and you'll go, why would we ever use the quotient rule for this problem? And I would agree with you. I would never do the quotient rule for this problem except in the situation of showing that it works. So let me call, again, I like first and second. If you like top and bottom, just the bottom is the second. So I'm gonna call the X to the eighth the first and the x to the second, the second, which makes the derivative of the first, take the eight out front, decrease its exponent by one, and that makes the derivative of the second, take the two out front and decrease its exponent by one. And again, I'll write the one all fancy so you can tell, but I won't write it anymore after this. So we got our top, our bottom, a derivative of our top, a derivative of our bottom. Those are the four pieces we need. All those four pieces go on the top and then there's just an extra bit in the denominator. The denominator happens to be the original denominator squared. Okay, so F prime of X. And I'm gonna be using, and this is my favorite. So the second, aka the bottom, times the derivative of the top. The first term has to have the derivative of the top. The second term has to have the derivative of the bottom. That is how I managed to memorize these when I was taking calculus back in, I won't say when. <laughs> uh, long, long time ago. The first term needs the derivative of the top or the first. The second term needs the derivative of the second or the bottom, however you're calling them. That was not as critical back in the product rule. The derivatives could go wherever you wanted them as long as it was a mix and match. The quotient rule, it's critical. The order is critical. Okay, so the second or the bottom, that was the x squared, so that's gonna be in black. So here's our bottom or second times Sorry, I've got something going on. 
I'm watching my dog to make sure nothing's about to happen. Might be too am I, but I've got an old dog who, who has a uh, really bad nosebleed sometimes for literally hours on ends and he's behaving like it's about to happen. <laughs> so I'm sorry that I'm distracted, but I don't want my carpet to get super bloody. And if that grosses you out, sorry for the TMI, but that's life. Okay, I'm gonna move on. Uh, he's next to me at least, okay. All right, so we had our second or bottom, whichever you prefer to call it, then times, that's supposed to be the derivative of the first. And again, you can put the derivative of the first before the x squared or after. The order of the black and red won't matter for this term. The derivative of the first being the 8x to the seventh. Then we have our minus symbol. So again, the black and the red here are interchangeable. This is just a way I like. That's how I've always done it for some reason. It is what it is, minus. Now the opposite, so we used this and this, sorry, uh, we used this and this, we used these two, so we'll need the x to the eighth and the two x to the first this time. So we have our first, which is the x to the eighth, times the derivative of the second or the derivative of the bottom, which was the two x to the first. But then we have the fraction bar, don't forget this. The quotient rule is literally a quotient. <laughs> and then it's supposed to be the bottom squared, the x squared, but then we have to square that. Generally, you're going to need a parenthesis for that. So again, the thing inside was the original bottom, but then we have the parenthesis squared that's part of the formula. That says the bottom squared. So the original bottom squared. And then we can clean this up. So x squared times 8x to the seventh is going to be 8x to the ninth minus x to the eighth times 2x would be 2x to the ninth and over. x squared squared, we just multiply the exponents and you get x to the fourth. Yes, you get the same thing if you add them, but that's not the rule. If this was an x cubed being squared, this would be x to the sixth, not x to the fifth. Make sure you know your exponent rules inside and out. There is no excuse in a calculus class not to know your algebra rules. It's kind of like when you go to driving school and then we put you on the road, you're on the road now. You gotta know the rules of the road. Algebra being the rules of the road. And we can clean this up. We can combine the top. So our f prime of x, 8x to the ninth minus 2x to the ninth is going to be 6x to the ninth. Then the bottom is just still our x to the fourth. But we can clean this up. We can subtract the exponents. 9 minus 4 is 5. Again, know your exponent rules inside and out. So this is our answer. So f prime of x ends up being very simple, just a 6x to the fifth. That's our derivative. Quotient rules are usually not this simple of an answer, but that's because this problem was not designed to be done with the quotient rule. It's meant to prove it works. So now let's go and say, I don't trust you. I'm not taking the leap of faith. You just gave me a formula. Do you trust this? So let's go back to the original function, which was x to the eighth over x to the second. You can simplify that top and bottom, subtract the exponents, you get x to the sixth. No more quotient rule needed, just a power rule, which means our f prime of x, take the six out front, leave the x alone, decrease its exponent by one, and you get six x, six x to the fifth, which is the same thing, it worked. Now, when you look at the blue, you can tell why your teacher on his own would never, ever, ever do it the other way. I would have definitely simplified this first and then applied the simple power rule because when you simplify it, it breaks down amazingly. But guess what? Not all fractions are going to simplify this greatly. You're gonna be mainly looking at things that have multiple terms in the top and the bottom, which complicates things <clears throat> and makes the quotient rule necessary. So while there are a lot of problems that you can get out of doing the product rule by pre-multiplying, there's not a lot of problems that you can avoid the quotient rule on. So it's kind of ironic that the more complicated formula is the one that you arguably need more. And that's again, because the product rule can be avoided in a lot of instances. So this is definitely a more complicated rule. Let's practice it some more. Wrong color, not that it technically matters, but I want consistency. B. So let's go with an original function. 
of x squared over x plus one. So this is a much more common type of problem. Okay, so whether you're calling them top and bottom, whether you're calling first and second, whether you're just going to call them f and g, uh, even though we call the original function altogether f, <clears throat> I mean, it'll work, but I'd be careful skating on that thin ice. It's not really appropriate. So the first, or the top, whichever you prefer to call it, would be the x squared. And the bottom, or the second, again, whichever you'd like to call it, would be the x plus 1. Let's take those derivatives individually, which they're pretty simple functions, so it's easy to do the derivative of the first, or top, 2x. It's about the 50th time we've seen that one already. And then the derivative of the second, or the derivative of the bottom, depending on how you like phrasing. The derivative of x, there's an imaginary little one in front of it, that's a linear term. The derivative is the coefficient. So the derivative of x is 1, then plus the derivative of 1 is 0. So again, it's not really necessary to write plus zero. The derivative of the x was the one, the derivative of this one is zero. Those are those two special cases that you'll see over and over and over and over and over. So really, I just wanna write the derivative of the second as one. That's the derivative doesn't look too great, there we go. And again, you could have been labeling these as t, b, t prime, and b prime. Nobody cares, it's all about understanding the formula, memorizing the formula, putting things in the right place. I just don't want to clutter my screen too much. So that tells us f prime of x, the derivative of this original function. If you forgot the rule, here it is. <clears throat> Again, I like this version. All the black and blue versions work. No matter what you're calling them, how you're labeling them, the order you do things, so I like second, then derivative of the first, minus first and derivative of the second. So the way I like it is just I like the regular functions to be the first and then the, the derivatives to be the second in each of the terms. I think my calculus teacher back in high school just always did things that way, so it stuck with me. <clears throat> regular function in the first spot, derivative in the second spot. It's also how I do my product rules, in fact. <clears throat> I'm going to... So when I go back and do my product rules from now on, you'll actually notice that I use the same pattern. And the reason for that is so I don't have a pattern for the product rule and a pattern for the quotient rule. <clears throat> that way I just memorize the quotient rule and remember that the product rule has a plus here instead and no bottom. That's it. <coughs> <coughs> Cough attack, dry air, allergies, all the fun stuff. Okay. So again. Second derivative of the first, first derivative of the second. So second is the x plus one. So I'll do that in black. Multiple terms of parentheses times. Then the derivative of the first, which is the two x. So again, my pattern is regular function derivative, then the minus regular function derivative. But it has to go. It has to be the derivative of the first in the first term, derivative of the second in the second term. You swap it and it's wrong. Okay, so the first, which would be the x squared, and times the derivative of the second, which was down here, the one. You should be using all four bits of the first, second, derivative of the first, derivative of the second, top, bottoms, whatever you're calling them. <clears throat> the bottom is now the original bottom square. The original bottom was x plus 1. Because it's got multiple terms, you got to wrap it into parentheses. I did it in the last one, too, even though it's arguably not necessary. But rule of thumb is you should probably have that bottom in a parentheses before squaring it. Now, what we will generally do, generally, we clean up the top only. 
generally. I'm not saying there aren't problems where we don't do something with the bottom. That's just usually what we focus on. So we get f prime of x equals. The 2x can be distributed to the x and the 1. So 2x times x is 2x squared. Then 2x times 1 is a plus 2x. Then we have a minus 1 times x squared is just minus x squared all over the bottom, which is x plus 1 squared. Back when we were dealing with rationals in pre-calculus and in algebra 1, algebra 2, whatever you had, we usually didn't mess with denominators very often once they were factored. And this is factor. So I don't really see a need to, to do anything with that unless maybe the top turns into a matching factor that can be reduced. But yeah, you're generally not going to expand that bottom. All right, well, there's like terms, 2x squared minus x squared. That's 2 minus 1, which is 1. So that's just a 1x squared, then the plus 2x, and then over the bottom, which is x plus 1 squared. That's it. That is our f prime of x. That's our derivative function. That's the function that di dictates the slope of x squared over x plus 1. Now, I can't <laughs> go through and verify this one, unfortunately. I can't do the blue stuff because this is a more complicated rational function than that one. It's above our pay grade in terms of uh, trying to go ahead and divide this ahead of time up front. You'd need long division, which you were taught in pre-calculus. Uh, but then the last term is still going to be a rational function of uh, over x plus 1. And there's a way that you can bring that x plus 1 to the top and do a power rule, but it needs something called the chain rule, which we haven't done yet. So I can't verify this one. you got to trust me. But hopefully, since the last one worked, hopefully you gained my trust with A enough that you know that B, you trust me that B is correct. So let's do another one. F of X equals X cubed minus one over X plus one. <clears throat> So once again, good idea to label first and second or top and bottom. I'll do top and bottom this time just to mix things up. So I'll call the x cubed minus 1 the top, the x plus 1 the bottom. So then the derivative of the top is this just a polynomial. No pro Now if, imagine if you had products and quotients inside of a top or inside of a bottom. That would make things even worse. It can happen. I won't do anything like that on a test necessarily, but you can mix products and quotients in a simpler way in, in a homework problem or a test problem. I'm saying I wouldn't have a product inside of a quotient necessarily. All right, so the top derivative, bring the 3 out front, decrease the exponent by 1. So that's the derivative of the x cubed. Then we have the minus 1. That's a constant. The derivative of a constant is 0. Then our bottom derivative. The derivative of x, I mean, it's literally the same as last time, so we should know it's 1. But the derivative of x is 1, because there's a coefficient of 1. The derivative of 1 is nothing. So there's our top and bottom derivatives. We have our top, our bottom, our top derivative, and our bottom derivative. That's the four things <clears throat> that go into our formula. So f prime of x is equal to. So we're going to do, again, the main issue is in the first term needs to be the derivative of the top. It doesn't matter if it goes first or second in the term. But again, in front of this minus, you need to have the derivative of the top and the regular bottom, whether they go first and second or second and first. It doesn't matter. But it has to have the derivative of the top here before the minus. So I'm going to go bottom, which is x plus 1, times the derivative of the top, which was the 3x squared. You can put the 3x squared, then the x plus 1. That's OK. That's what I was emphasizing. Then the minus, that's not a fraction bar, just an emphasized, overemphasized minus. Now, because we use the derivative of the first or the derivative of the top here, we're going to flip flop and do the derivative of the bottom or second in the, in the second bit after the minus. So I like to go the top, which is black, x cubed minus 1 times the derivative of the bottom which was 1. 
then all over the bottom squared, which is x plus 1 squared. OK, we can clean this up. The 3x squared can be distributed to the x and the plus 1. So that's going to be 3x cubed plus 3x squared. Distributing a 1 to something does nothing, but there's a minus that needs to be distributed. So what's going to happen is the x cubed and the minus 1 are going to change signs because this was a minus in front of it. So that's now a minus x cubed and a plus 1. This is where people make simple mistakes. They don't distribute negatives. They don't pay attention. In the bottom is still our x plus 1 squared. Again, the bottom is generally not going to get simplified. So that prime of x equals the 3x cubed minus the x cubed. Remember, no number in front of it means a 1. 3 minus 1 is 2. So 3x cubed minus 1x cubed is 2x cubed. Then we have our plus 3x squared. Then we have our plus 1. That's the entire top. We were only able to crunch together a pair of terms, and the bottom is x plus 1 squared. This is our derivative, as simple as it can get. And as I note, noted earlier, maybe the top can be factored to then reduce the whole fraction. Maybe. Sometimes it can. If it can, then do so. If it can't, then don't. That's going to have variability from problem to problem. Okay, <clears throat> so we've gone over our product rule, we've gone over our quotient rule. I've emphasized 10,000 times already the need to memorize them. You are not going to pass that first test if you don't know the definition of the derivative based on the limit. You're not going to pass this test if you don't know your power rule and the special cases for a constant and a linear term. You're not going to pass this test if you don't know your product and quotient rules. I mean, you could probably miss the quotient rule and still pass, but you're not going to pass well. You could probably pass this test without knowing the definition, but you're not going to make an A or a B. You need to know all of those. These are the things you have to memorize. The definition, the power rule and its two special cases, the product rule, the quotient rule. You've got to know how to use them. You've got to go to the homework and do this stuff. You're not going to learn it by watching me do it. That's how you pick up on things, but then you have to regurgitate it. You have to do it yourself. And if you do your homework and you get 100 on it and you still don't feel like you know it, Go back and hit similar example on those homework problems. It'll keep your green check mark, but you can try it again, and it'll be a similar example. Not the same, but close. Go to the textbook. Look at the homework problems. Find ones that are similar to what you did on your homework. Find ones that are similar to what I do on the lecture. Again, the problems in the lecture are going to be comparable to the test in general. All right, so let's get into kind of a, a side bit of information, but it all relates. It's something I could have, I did talk about a little bit in the last section uh, with marginals. So remember that for given cost, uh, revenue, or profit functions, which are C of X, R of X and P of X, respectively. Their, an IR, their marginal derivatives, or their marginals, which are marginal cost, revenue, profit, are the derivatives. Marginal cost is C prime of X. <clears throat> Marginal revenue is R prime of X. And marginal 
mm, profit is p prime of x. And as a reminder, profit is revenue minus cost. P of x is R of x minus C of x. Hmm. Cost is how much you spend to make your items, to sell your items. Revenue is the money you get at the stores for selling your items. Profit is the difference of what you make and what you spend. <clears throat> so if it costs you $1,000 to make a whole bunch of items, then you sell it for $2,000, that means your profit would be 2,000 minus 1,000, which is 1,000. Buy for one, sell for two. Classic way of making money. <clears throat> Doesn't mean your profit has to be that way. Maybe you spend $1,000 on your items, you sell them for 1,200, and then your profit's 200. Profit for a lot of businesses tends to be in like the 20 to 30% ballpark. Um, at least when you're talking economic, uh, or sorry, when you're talking accounting profit, when you talk economic profit, eh, that's another story. And we don't dive too heavy into economics and accounting information in here, but we do glance at it, especially with things like this. So for an example, uh, example three, let's say a business has a cost model, C of X is equal to Five x plus seven, and a revenue model of oh, why did it put it over there? That there we go. Cool. Uh, let's go with x squared. Uh, minus 10x, sorry, negative x squared plus 10x. I have my signs backwards. Uh, plus <clears throat> 100. Find the profit function. <clears throat> Then all three marginals. So maybe we're selling CDs, maybe we're selling hay, maybe we're selling owl figurines, maybe we're selling glasses, I don't know. <clears throat> all I know is we got a cost function, we got a revenue function, we wanna find the profit function, then we wanna find the marginals. And we're not gonna do any crazy extensive information with them, we're not gonna get into optimization, we'll save that for a later chapter. But we can at least start this idea. So your cost function is 5x plus 7. Your revenue function is this negative x squared plus 10x plus 100. We want to find the profit. Well, p of x, we already said, is the difference of revenue and cost. r of x minus c of x. I'm just going to go to my pen now. So the revenue function was negative x squared plus 10x plus 100. That's our revenue function. So then a minus. Then our cost function is this 5x plus 7. And I hope that everyone would instantly recognize that this is not correct because to subtract the cost function, if it's got multiple terms, it's about the 10 million time we've needed extra parentheses here. So we can distribute that negative, which gives us negative x squared plus 10x plus 100 minus 5x minus 7. And then we can combine our like terms to get our profit function, which is negative x squared. The 10x minus the 5x is going to give us a plus 5x. And then the 100 minus the 7 is going to be a plus 93.
Now, again, I have no sense of reality with this, uh, with these models here. I just kind of made them up on the fly. Uh, if you f wanted to say find the profit at zero items sold, it wouldn't make sense because you'd find that you're making $93. Maybe you're doing that through tax cuts or something like that. Um, you know, cheating, che whether it's cheating the system or completely legal. But it is unusual to produce, if I put zero for the X being the number of items, I'd get 93 here. It doesn't quite make sense. But again, this is just giving us an idea of how these fly. So there's our profit function. That was only the first thing. We also wanted all the marginals. So now that we have cost, revenue, and profit, we can do all three marginals. The derivative of cost would be the marginal cost. <clears throat> well, that's 5x plus 7. Just take its derivative. The derivative of 5x is 5, because it's a linear term, special case. The derivative of 7 is 0. So that's it. So this is our marginal cost. This is the cost to produce the next item. So in other words, if you want to if you know the cost to produce 50 items, if you want to find out, well, what's the cost just to produce the 51st item? It's this thing where you'd plug 50 into it. You would plug, if you want to find out the marginal at 51, you plug in 50. There's actually nothing to plug in here, which says the next cost always is always five bucks. It's going to cost you five bucks to make the next CD or five bucks to make the next figurine, whatever we're talking about. For our revenue, <clears throat> R prime of X, it's an ugly R, but it's an R. Taking the derivative of negative X squared is going to give us negative 2X. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, the derivative of 10X, so that's a plus 10 because it's a linear term, so we just drop the X. And then the derivative of 100 is 0. So this is the marginal revenue. And again, this might not necessarily make sense, but that's not the point of this. So that's the cost to, I'm sorry, that's the run, money we would take in, not cost, that's the money we would take in from the next item. So if we want to say, well, all right, if we have this as our revenue, how much revenue will the, the first item bring in? Well, you'd plug in a zero to find out the marginal at one. So two times zero, zero plus 10, you'd bring in 10 for the next one. All right, well, how much does the second item bring in? You'd plug in one. Negative two times one is negative two plus 10 is eight. So the second item would bring in eight. The third item would actually bring in six. It's decreasing each time. And again, this is not necessarily typical to decrease that fast for a standard thing in the real world. We're just getting an idea. And then the marginal revenue, excuse me, the marginal profit. That's the derivative of the profit function, which was this thing. That would be negative 2x plus 5. The derivative of the negative x squared gives us the negative 2x. The derivative of 5x is 5. The derivative of 93 is 0. So this is the marginal profit, which actually states that we're only, pro we're only profitable for a short term because this term is going to keep growing in the negatives which means we'd be losing money. So it sounds like we would need to grow our business to become more profitable and change our business model, which would change our equation models. Maybe we need more employees. Maybe we need a bigger space. Maybe we have to change how we network. I don't know. But this is how we get the marginals. So if I give you a cost or revenue function, you build the marginal by taking derivatives. That's not the only type of marginal we study, though. We also study marginal averages. Well, hold on. Before I get into that, let's talk about the average first. I haven't done the average with us. I was thinking I had, but I haven't. The average, whether it's cost, prof, uh, revenue, or profit function is... If you're using cost, it's C of X divided by X. Let me write that a little cleaner. C of X divided by X. That would be the average cost. 
the average revenue would be R of X divided by X and the average profit would be guess what P of X divided by X. So again, with real business models, linear costs, revenues and profits generally don't exist. If they were linear, then all these averages would be the exact same. It would cost you $5 to produce the first, $5 to produce the second, $5 to produce the third. So the average cost of each of them would be five. But in the real world, in the real world, we usually have what we call a descending average. So the more we make, the lower the average cost is of each. So it might cost you $5 to make the first one, but it only costs you $4 to make the 10th one. And it might cost you only $3 to make the 100th one and maybe only $2 to make the 2,051st one. So your costs are hopefully descending as you make more and more in terms of a unit cost. So what is an average? You add up the number of things and you divide by the total number of them. X represents the total number of them. That's why we just take the original function and divide by X. So these are our average costs. These are our average revenues. These are our average profits. But there are also, as I already spoiled earlier, marginals on these things. So let me go here. Let me just push this down actually. There we go. So the marginal average cost or revenue or profit function is. And I'm just going to spoil this in parentheses up here. Take the derivatives of the previous line. So your marginal average cost is d dx, the derivative of the average cost. or your marginal average revenue is the derivative of the average revenue. Or your marginal average profit would be DDX of the profit function divided by x. Again, you just take the average functions and do the derivative. But what's important here is that you understand that you do the average, then the derivative, not the derivative, then the average. If you do the derivative and then divide by x, that is wrong, 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 wrong. You have to find the associated average cost first, then you have to go and do the marginal. These are often represented with uh, bars. So your average cost C bar, oops, C bar over X, I'm sorry, C over X is generally called C bar. So it'll look like this. Or the average revenue function would be R bar, or the average profit function would be P bar which would make the marginal ones C bar prime of X or R bar prime of X or P bar prime of X. That's the notation for your averages. A little bar over the letter means it's an average. A little one next to the letter means it's, in, means it's a marginal, it's a derivative. So average is a bar. A little one that looks like an exponent or a, a single quote tells us marginal, tells us derivative. So again, you have to do the average, then take the derivative. I'm 
I'm gonna highlight that bad boy. That's how we find our marginal averages. And ah, sorry, I'm my other folder with my next example is somewhere else. Give me about fifteen seconds. Here it is. Okay. Hmm. Uh, I'm on draw. That's why. So example three. No, example four. Yes, example four. Because I typed the last one, it threw me off. <laughs> <clears throat> where I wrote example, that is to say. All right. Printing on demand. Is a recent development in publishing that makes it feasible Print small quantities of books, thereby eliminating overstock and storage costs. For example, a typical 200 page book cost $18 per copy with fixed costs. Fifteen hundred bucks. Therefore, using a fixed plus variable model, c of x is equal to eighteen x plus fifteen hundred. <clears throat> I've mentioned this in passing that a lot of cost models are based on a fixed cost and a variable cost. So we have a fixed cost of fifteen hundred dollars. So they just say, all right, you got to pay fifteen hundred bucks for us to do this at all. But then every time you want to copy, we're only going to charge you 18 bucks. So you pay 1500 bucks upfront for consultation, setup, blah, blah, blah. But then after that, if you want one copy, you pay another 18 bucks. If you want hundred copies, you'll pay 18 bucks per copy. So 18 bucks per copy means 18 X. So this is the variable cost 18 times the number of copies. So this is where X is the number of copies. number of books, number of copies, whatever. What we want to do is, A, find the average cost, B, find the marginal average cost, C, find the marginal average cost, at X equals 100, and interpret. Oh, why are you doing that to me? Word annoys me sometimes. We'll do it this way then. Okay. So we have our cost function. Now, I don't have to give you this. Setting up a standard fixed variable model is something I expect of my Algebra 1 students. So that should let you know, I expect calculus students to be able to handle a variable cost and a fixed cost to set up a standard linear model. If we have a nonlinear model, I give you the function. 
and I still give you the, the linear model most of the time, but I do reserve the right to not give you that cost function. So part A, find the average cost. So I didn't ask for the, just the marginal cost. The marginal cost would be 18, which says it always costs $18 to produce the next unit. That makes sense. It says right here, it costs $18 to make each next unit. So for part A, <clears throat> we're finding the average cost, which is C bar. That means average, which is where we take the regular cost and divide it by X. The regular cost being 18X plus 1500. And then we divide that by X. Let me write it a little cleaner though. I don't know why I got so ugly all of a sudden. Come on, thank you. This is our C bar. This is our average cost function. So if you produced zero units, you plug in X equals zero and your average cost would be infinitely many, infinite because you'd be dividing by zero. If you produced one unit, then your average cost would be 1518. So it's costing you $1,518 to make one unit. If you produce two units, two times 18 is 36. 36 was 1,500 is 1,536. And then the bottom's two. So what's that? 1,536, half of that would be what, 768? Uh, yeah, 768. So it would cost you on average 1518 to make one unit, but it only costs you 768 to make two units. And that's because as you make more and more units, that fixed cost has a less and less and less effect on the average cost. All right, B, find the marginal average. So we're finding C bar prime now. We're taking what we just got and doing its derivative. So that's d dx. I'll write out the fancy way of 18x plus 1500 over x. Now, I will say that since this is in the product and quotient rule section, you might think that, oh, okay, well, let me go ahead and do this with the product or quotient rule. That's fine, but it's also not the easiest way to do it. So I want to I want to show you a special scenario here. Because the denominator is just x, it doesn't have x plus 5, it's not x squared minus something, it's just a single term. Because the bottom is single term, we can skip the quotient rule. So because, because the bottom is a single term, we can skip the quotient rule. I don't want to do that. Nope. So check this out. Before we go into the derivative stuff, 18x plus 1500 over x. Let's split this up. You can only do this if the bottom has one term. If you go back to the previous examples where we did the quotient rule, two terms, got to do it. Two terms, got to do it. But because this is one term, you can actually split this as 18x over x plus 1500 over x. Then we can simplify. The x's cancel with the 18, so that's just 18 plus, and we know we're going to end up taking a derivative of this, so let's bring the x to the top. So that's 1500 x to the negative one. That was an x to the positive one in the bottom, so we make it a negative one in the top. So this is avoiding the quotient rule. Now it's just the power rule when we go to take the derivative. So c bar prime of x is the derivative of just 18 plus 1500 x to the negative one. The derivative of 18 is nothing. I'll write the zero here for emphasis. Plus, then we have the 1500, we leave that at out front. We take the exponent down. <clears throat> so take the exponent down. And then the x is gonna decrease by one. Negative one minus one is negative two, not zero. Negative one minus one is negative two, not zero. 
well, we don't need to write the zero plus. The negative one times the 1500 is negative 1500. So that's negative 1500 times x to the negative second. But we generally don't like negative exponents of the answers. So that's negative 1500 over x to the positive two. So the marginal average cost is negative 1500 over x squared. That's our marginal average cost. This is the function that tells us how the average is changing as we produce another unit and another unit and another unit. Now, the only variable we have is in the bottom. Now, the bigger x gets, the smaller this whole thing gets. If you take x equals 1, you get negative 1,500. So that says that the average is dropping by like $1,500 to produce the second unit. Now, I've said before that these are not exact. These are approximations, especially early on, because that's not exactly true. We already talked about the average uh, going from like 1,500 to 768. It was like 1,518 to 768. That didn't quite drop 1,500. So it's not a perfect predictor initially, but it's pretty good as you go further down the line. So part C was... Find the marginal average cost at x equals 100 and interpret. Find the marginal average cost at x equals 100 and interpret. So what that means is we're going to plug in 100 here. So c bar prime of 100, which is negative 1,500 over 100 squared, which is negative 1,500 over a 1 with four zeros, just double the number of zeros. We can cancel two pairs of zeros. So that's negative 15 over 100. We can divide both of those by 5. So that's negative 3 over 20. Or if you like the decimal, uh, that would be negative 0 0.15. There's a fraction. There's a decimal. doesn't matter which, is, which it is. What this states is, the average cost to produce the 101st unit, um, the 101st unit, uh, sorry, 101st book, instead of saying unit, let's be more specific, book or copy, is decreasing. by 15 cents. But only for the 101st. If you do this at any different value, if you find the marginal average cost at say 10, so let's do a D in fact. I don't normally do this, but I think this is important. Let's do C, pro, C bar prime of 10. That would be negative 1,500 over 10 squared, which is negative 1,500 over 100, which is negative $15. So that would say the average cost to produce the 11th book is decreasing by $15. That's insane. When you're going from 10 to 11 books, your average cost is dropping from maybe 100 to 85, basically. I don't know the actual average cost. I'm not plugging that in. I'm just spitballing. So if the average cost to produce the 10th unit was $100, that says you can expect the average to do the 11th to be about 85. It should be 15 bucks lower. Yes, you're still paying a higher cost because if you make more books, you're paying more money, but the average is decreasing. And that is usually good for business because if you can produce more and have your average cost decrease per unit, that leaves you more room to make profit. It also leaves you room to drop the price of your item if demand slows down so if, demand, if your demand function decreases, if people don't want to pay as much, uh, if you're producing a ton and the average cost is low uh, to make more, then you can go ahead and make more 
and still have room for profit by maybe, you know, maybe you produce a hundred more units, you drop the price of your item by a dollar and you could still be more profitable because of this decreasing average cost function. So as a business, this is definitely where you wanna be. You wanna see your marginal average cost be decreasing over time. This type of function, this rational function with X's in the bottom, this is where you wanna be as a business. Now, they don't have to be polynomials and rationals. You can have radicals and all sorts of crazy stuff involved. But I'm just giving you an idea as to how you like things to flow in a real world sense. I'm going to point out one more thing and then we're gonna call it a day. I always throw one of these on a test and students always have a difficult time with them. What they do is they just do a marginal, they don't do a marginal average. This is recorded. Please go back and watch this again and listen to me say this 10 or 100 times. A marginal average function is not just a marginal, it's not just an average. You've got to do the average, then the marginal, which means derivative. If you just take the costs and do the derivative, if I ask for a marginal cost, that's fine. If I ask for a marginal average cost, it's completely wrong. And historically speaking, more than half of my students get it wrong. Even after I warn them that on the first test, you would see one of these. So I am hoping that you will take this seriously and make sure you understand these slightly more complicated problems. I know, especially when you give this funny notation, bars and primes and, you know, it's a lot to keep track of. Practice makes perfect, going back and taking notes again, rewatching things, studying the notes that you take, whatever you have to do is going to help. So we have finished section, I keep wanting to say 2.4 because that's my old book, which is where this example came from. Uh, there are good examples in our text uh, as well for that, but I just really like that one, so I use it. So we have just finished 1.6. So that means that the homework is due in a week. I believe in my math lab, I've already updated that. So 1.6 should be due on the 9th. All the other due dates have been stated. Uh, so please make sure you're keeping up with the homework. There are two homework problems in 1.6 that I have omitted. I believe they were the last two. Uh, they were definitely above our pay grade in terms of complexity. So don't worry about those. I wouldn't do uh, any test questions of that complex of a nature. So if you don't have any questions, We'll call it a day. You can always email me. This video should be on YouTube and linked through Canvas in the next half hour, roughly. Besides that, have a good day. Study hard, do lots of homework. We'll see you on the internet Thursday. Take care.